Hello, my name is Daniel Hastings, the department head of the MIT Aeronautics and Astronautics Department. It is my honor and privilege to introduce this event for Professor Sheila Widnall. Her career at MIT and outside is characterized by first. She's been a trailblazer in so many ways. She's been a role model for many of us. In this event, we will hear about many of her contributions inside and outside MIT. Sheila Widnall entered MIT as a first year student in 1956. She received her bachelor's in 1960, her master's in 61, and her PhD in 64. She was the first woman appointed to the faculty of the MIT School of Engineering. She majored in and received her degrees in aeronautics and astronautics. Her principal fields of interest were unsteady lifting surface theory, vortex aerodynamics, vortex stability. She became famous for the Widnall instability, which we will hear about. She was the first woman to serve as chair of the faculty at MIT. She served as chair of numerous faculty committees, such as the Committee on Discipline, and she chaired a number of important ad hoc faculty committees to determine policies for issues faced by MIT. We will hear about these. In her first Washington experience, she served as director of university research at the US Department of Transportation in 1974. She later served as associate provost at MIT. She was appointed secretary of the Air Force by President Clinton. She was the first woman to serve in this role. She was instrumental in leading the Air Force to write down its three core values, which I learned when I joined. Excellence in all you do, integrity first, and service before self. She also asked the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board to undertake an update called New World Vistas on the famous Towards New Horizons look at technology for the Air Force's future, as von Kármán had done at the birth of the Air Force in 1947. She moved the Air Force to write down its long-range vision statement to global engagement, which set the path to the Space Force in the century. She stepped down from her position as Secretary of the Air Force on October 31, 1997, to return to her faculty position at MIT, where she was appointed as Institute Professor. Dr. Widnall is member and past Vice President of the National Academy of Engineering, past President of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, as well as past President of the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics, AIAA. She served as co-chair of the recent NASM report on the sexual harassment of women in science and technology, which has been hugely influential in many scientific institutions. Dr. Widnall has been a trustee of the Carnegie Corporation, the Aerospace Corporation, director of Draper Labs, Chemical Fabrics Incorporated, a trustee of the Boston Museum of Science. She was a member of the Carnegie Commission on Science, Technology and Government, she served as trustee of the Sloan Foundation, Institute for Defense Analysis, and GenCorp. She was a member of the Space Shuttle Columbia Accident Investigation Board. She has received many awards and recently received the AIAA Guggenheim Award in 2019. This is the most prestigious award in aerospace engineering. She is a fellow of the APS, the AAAS, an honorary fellow of the AIAA, an honorary fellow of IEEE, a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society, a member of the International Academy of Astronautics, the National Academy of Engineering, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, also AAAS. She has received 17 honorary degrees, including one from Oxford University. I got to know her when I came to the department in 1985 as an assistant professor. We're on the same floor in Building 37. We did not interact that much since I was in the space area she was working on fluids. I got to know much better when Professor Earl Merman asked both of us to serve on the first department-wide strategic plan committee in the early 90s. It was very clear she was someone who could really think and see the big picture. Later on, we shared an office suite together. One anecdote that sticks in my mind is one day a person came to see her. When she and I were both out talking in the suite, there was no assistant there. That person assumed she was the assistant and acted that way towards her. She let this person know in no uncertain terms that his assumption was incorrect. I was very proud of a take no prisoners response to correct this blatant bias as it happened in real time. In another anecdote, we had a meeting of the faculty to do graduate admissions. At the end, she pointed out that we had waitlisted all the women and accepted many men. She was right. I was as guilty as the others in the room. I'd never done that again. Later on, she became Secretary of the Air Force and invited me to participate in some Air Force activities at Maxwell Air Force Base that were very insightful. I was subsequently asked to be on the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board to be Air Force Chief Scientist. We overlapped by a month in the Pentagon. She and I also served on an NRO committee where she was the chair. Again, she showed a high quality in how she ran the committee. 
Back at MIT, she became an institute professor. Since we appreciated the value of systems thinking together, she joined the Engineering Systems Division, and we were colleagues in that unit, as well as Aero Astro. In her time in the department, she's continued to be an advocate for women and for students in the department. As an institute professor, she's one of the wise people at MIT who are part of the backbone of the place. She's someone we've all looked up to and asked how we can do as well as she has done. We're so proud of her presence with us. In the next set of presentations, you will hear from some of her colleagues in the department, all the women secretaries of the Air Force, the former vice chief of staff of the Air Force, about some of her students, hear about the famous Whitney on instability, her impact at MIT and on the National Academy of Engineering. Hello everyone, I'm Ananta Chandrakasan, Dean of Engineering. It is my deep honor to be here to celebrate the incredible career and accomplishments of Institute Professor Sheila Widnall. Sheila's impact on the MIT School of Engineering has been truly remarkable. From her undergraduate experience to her professional career, she has been admired for her intellect, ambition, and leadership. Sheila's journey with the School of Engineering began when she entered through the doors as a first year undergraduate student in 1956. When Sheila arrived to MIT that fall, she was surprised by several things. The architecture of the women's dorm on Bay State Road and the incredibly low number of women in her class, a total of 23. For context, at that time, there were 129 female students out of the 6,000 students total. In 1956, it was very unusual for women at MIT to pursue graduate studies. Sheila was one of only two female students to go straight to graduate school. As Sheila advanced through MIT from undergraduate to graduate student to professor, the proportion of women kept shrinking. In fact, in one Aero faculty photograph from 1967, she's the only woman present. As more and more women arrived at MIT, Sheila worked to make sure they felt welcome and confident. In 1974, she and fellow pioneering faculty member, the late Institute Professor Millie Dresselhaus, created a first year seminar called, What is Engineering? It was meant to demonstrate what a career in the field could look like, geared towards students who may not have realized they could pursue one. Sheila's teaching activities have included undergraduate dynamics, and aerodynamics, graduate level aerodynamics of wings and bodies, aeroelasticity, acoustics and aerodynamic noise, and aerospace vehicle vibration. And let it be noted, it's likely she was the first undergraduate advisor to take her advisees on an indoor skydiving trip in a vertical wind tunnel. Professor Vidnall's incredible scholarship and contributions to the field of fluid dynamics are widely known and recognized. There's actually an instability called the Vidnall instability in the field of fluid dynamics, and this is an incredible honor. Sheila's impact in her field has been remarkable, and in 1992, her impact on the School of Engineering and MIT was already significant. That year, Sheila was appointed Associate Provost. Within a year, in 1993, Sheila was appointed Secretary of the Air Force by President Clinton and became the first woman to head a branch of the U.S. military. She held this honorable role until she stepped down in 1997 and returned to MIT to resume her faculty role and administrative role as Associate Provost. In 1998, Sheila was named Institute Professor, the highest honor awarded by the faculty and administration at MIT. Sheila has been the recipient of numerous and prestigious accolades, but of note in 2009, the National Academy of Engineering presented her with the Arthur M. Bika Award for expanding opportunities for women and minorities. She was honored for a remarkable academic career in fluid dynamics combined with the highest levels of public service and for championing the role of women in engineering. When it comes to the school, I find it difficult to adequately summarize Sheila's tremendous impact. Academically, she paved new paths as an undergraduate and graduate student, and eventually as a senior faculty member. 
Administratively, she chaired committees such as the recent search for the current Aero Astro department head. Sheila navigated uncharted territory by laying the foundations for diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts at the school and across MIT. I'm reminded of a meeting when Sheila presented to Engineering Council. Sheila's thought-provoking dialogue raised awareness and inspired creativity in the approach to student advising. As you will hear soon from President Reif, in 2018, Sheila co-chaired a report commissioned by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine aimed to explore the impact of sexual harassment of women in those fields. Sheila's work on the NASM report has inspired our School of Engineering students and staff to speak out and work together with faculty to transform our teaching and research environments and to create a place where all can excel without the obstacles of harassing behavior. Sheila has been a major role model and trailblazer for women in engineering. We're forever indebted for her impact, influence, and leadership, and honored to have her as a part of the MIT School of Engineering community for the past 64 years. Sheila, congratulations. We wish you the very best on your next chapter. I'm Rafael Reif. MIT's president, and I'm honored and delighted to say a few words about Sheila Whitnell. I was asked to talk about her influence on MIT as institute professor. To start, let me say that institute professor is the highest distinction MIT can award to a faculty member. At any one time, there are only about a dozen institute professors. That's because MIT bestows this honor only on those rare faculty who embody the highest ideals of leadership, accomplishment, and service. Sheila was recognized as an institute professor in 1998, 22 years ago. That was also the year she returned to MIT after taking a four-year break to serve the nation as Secretary of the Air Force. Becoming an institute professor is a capstone moment, the crown on an exceptional career. At that point, Sheila could have decided to relax. But slowing down or stepping back from anything are simply not in the nature of Sheila Whitnell. So instead, she committed herself to continuous forward motion so she could continue to do a tremendous amount of good. During her time as institute professor, she also took on a few little side assignments, like serving as vice president of the National Academy of Engineering for seven years, and becoming the first woman to serve as president of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. But I want to focus on one major effort she led more recently, which is having a profound impact nationally as well as on MIT. Throughout her career, Sheila has been a champion for the advancement of women, guided by the conviction that the strongest possible MIT is one where all people of exceptional talent are able to work together with mutual trust and respect. The fact that MIT's student body today is 47% women flows directly from Sheila's tireless work on improving the admissions process to allow us to recruit the most talented students. And when she led the Air Force, she also co-chaired the Department of Defense Task Force on discrimination and sexual harassment. So in the next phase of her career, Sheila decided to lead the nation toward repairing an unfair system in which the scientific careers of women are all too often derailed by sexual harassment, a system that diminishes the entire research enterprise. In 2016, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, or NASM, appointed Sheila to a new leadership role, co-chair of a committee of eminent scholars and scientists 
charged with studying the impact of sexual harassment on women in these three large and influential academic and professional domains. With Sheila at the wheel, it was destined to be much more than a theoretical exercise. She and her co-authors produced a landmark report. When I first read it, I immediately recognized Sheila's influence. The rigor, the directness, the no-nonsense problem-solving attitude of a superb engineer. I was also impressed by the choice to capture the nature of the problem with a central image. The report compares harassing behaviors to an iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is the behaviors that are obvious and obviously unacceptable, but relatively uncommon, from sexual coercion to assault. Below the waterline, however, is a much greater mass of harmful behaviors that are much more common and very often invisible, except to people being harmed by them. Behaviors like sexist insults and sabotage of women's lab equipment which can, cumulatively, diminish and even destroy a brilliant career. A powerful visualization of an amorphous problem, based on facts, data, observation in the field. This, I thought, is very, very MIT. Since then, the findings of the NASEM report and its evidence-based recommendations have served as a call to action for institutions of higher education around the nation, and certainly here at MIT. Sheila, we are incredibly proud of your role in bringing forth this groundbreaking work, and we are deeply grateful for your guidance and inspiration. From the moment she arrived at MIT with the class of 1960, Sheila has welcomed every opportunity to soar. Looking back on her career is to see her dealing calmly with wildly unpredictable forces and pressures, fearless in the face of turbulence, and driving forward with unstoppable energy to elevate everyone in her community. In short, Sheila not only studied fluid dynamics, she lived it. And in the process, she has shown generations of women and men how incredibly rewarding a life in science and engineering can be. Sheila, it has been a pleasure and an inspiration to witness the trajectory of your formidable career. I send you my very best wishes for a wonderful and fulfilling retirement. Hello, I'm Marty Schmidt, and I have the pleasure of serving as MIT's provost. One of the real honors of this job is that the institute professors report to the provost's office, and so I get to meet with each of them on a regular basis. I have to say that my regular meetings with Sheila have been a real treat for me. And today I'd like to share a provost's office perspective on one of the profound impacts that Sheila has had at MIT. One of the most important ways that MIT faculty contribute to the governance and overall health of the Institute is by service on committees, whether so-called standing committees that deal with ongoing policies and procedures over time, or short-term ad hoc committees that are convened to address particular issues in need of a solution. Over the span of her 55 plus years on the MIT faculty, Sheila has served on more than her fair share of committees. But I would say that the number of committees that Sheila has led that ended up having important, lasting impact on MIT's academic culture is way above average for our community. Sheila served at numerous times throughout her career on a range of faculty committees, but I wanted to mention four special committees that Sheila chaired that I feel were particularly consequential for MIT life, in each case leading to policies that continue to guide and define our academic community and to give you a sense of the leadership that Sheila provided in these areas. The first committee was the Committee on Reorganization and Closing of Academic Units. This committee was formed to better understand the circumstances surrounding the closure of the Department of Applied Biological Sciences in 1988. To learn from that unique experience, 
and to provide guidelines that could be applied to similar circumstances in the future. The committee reached two critically important conclusions. The first, the idea that the administration and the faculty share a joint responsibility for sustaining the excellence of the Institute, including shared participation in reaching significant decisions and in the planning and implementation of the results of those decisions. And second, the need to formalize the principle that tenure is held by the faculty in the institution rather than in a department or other academic unit. Shortly thereafter, the language of MIT's policies and procedures was amended to reflect these two principles, which form a fundamental part of MIT's academic culture and continue to guide us today. The second committee was the Committee on Access to and Disclosure of Scientific Information. In the aftermath of the events of September 11, 2001, the Institute began to face challenging questions related to its mission to provide public service in the context of changing world conditions. Largely via the Patriot Act, the government had begun to implement new guidelines regarding access to research information and materials and regarding the disclosure of research results. As the report stated, there was a growing national pressure to treat research results as sensitive, which created a new set of circumstances for faculty and students and for MIT as an institution. And so the provost and the chair of the faculty commissioned this committee to re-examine MIT's role with regard to the dissemination of research conducted on our campus. The report affirmed that MIT, to fulfill its mission, must have an open intellectual environment. Education and scholarship are best served through the unconstrained sharing of information and by creating the opportunities for free and open communication. It therefore concluded that a free flow of research results and information on the MIT campus is the best way for MIT to fulfill its public service responsibility and recommended that no classified research should be carried out on campus, that no student, graduate or undergraduate, should be required to have a security clearance to perform thesis research. The report issued a number of other recommendations that along with the pivotal ones I just described, had a lasting influence on the research guidelines we follow today regarding such issues as export control, situations that may arise from the exposure of faculty or students to research of a sensitive nature, the possession or transporting of select biological agents, and issues related to maintaining open access and publication of results from industry-sponsored research. I also recommend the report to anyone interested in learning about the history of MIT's role in the formation of guidelines for managing the access and control of scientific information, beginning with the World War II era. The third committee was the Committee on Managing Potential Conflicts of Interest in Research in 2010. In the context of a concern related to the growing complexity of relationships between university researchers and industry, this committee reviewed the kinds of individual and institutional relationships that could give rise to the perception or reality of conflicts of interest. It assessed regulations, legal requirements, and best practices at other major institutions and examined the Institute's policies and procedures related to conflict of interest for both faculty and staff. The committee recommended a broad set of policies designed to strengthen our mechanisms for monitoring and reporting conflicts of interest, primarily by means of a sweeping redesign of the Institute's annual outside professional activities process. These recommendations were immediately adopted and form the OPA process that we follow today, helping to protect the integrity of the research activities that take place in all areas of the Institute. And finally, the fourth committee was the Committee on the Structure of the Harvard-MIT Health Sciences and Technology effort at MIT in 2011. This committee was charged with examining the structure of HST and to suggest ways that the program could optimize its alignment with other academic units at MIT given the growing importance of biomedical engineering and science that was evident at the time. At the recommendation of the committee in 2012, MIT established the Institute for Medical Engineering and Science, or IMES, as is widely known, and based it in the School of Engineering. 
Now thriving, IMS serves as the administrative home for HST and brings together research and education efforts at the intersection of engineering, science, and clinical medicine to advance human health. IMS also builds strategic partnerships with hospitals and industry in order to seek solutions to major medical challenges. Over 30 MIT faculty are affiliated with IMS. All of these committee reports have a few things in common. They're extremely clear, well-written, and informative. They speak to issues of critical importance to the Institute's mission, they exhibited foresight, and they have had a lasting impact on our academic policies and structure. Sheila had the special ability to lead a committee to consensus on important and sometimes contentious issues, in large part by remaining dedicated to MIT's most important principles as an institution of learning and research, and by always keeping academic integrity at the top of her focus. MIT has benefited enormously from her leadership in these areas, and this leadership will form an important part of her legacy at MIT. I'd also know briefly that Sheila held the position of Associate Provost for roughly a year prior to accepting the position of Secretary of the Air Force in 1993. And in this position, she had a special responsibility for addressing the quality of life for faculty. Sheila took this responsibility seriously. And while I wasn't there, I'm told, and I regret that we haven't found the video yet to prove it, that Sheila would get exercised in that era by taking a daily spin around Killian Court, weather permitting, on rollerblades, dressed in a distinctive and colorful bodysuit. It sounds like good training for leading the Air Force and showed that Sheila was an excellent role model for our faculty in more ways than one. Thank you very much. Dan asked me to share some memories of what MIT was like back when Sheila and I were students. That's dangerous, of course. Niels Bohr famously referred to his disagreement with Heisenberg, and he claimed, it's funny. As you get older, you remember things that never happened. I began my journey at MIT as a lifer here 65 years ago in the class of 1957. Sheila was three years behind me in the class of 1960. We didn't know each other until the 60s when she joined the MIT Aero Department faculty as our first female professor. MIT in the 50s was gray. When my daughter Leslie was a doctoral student, she informed me that MIT's colors were not cardinal and gray, as I had always thought, but rather blood on concrete. The infinite corridor represented a long road to a real job in science or engineering. Admission then was highly competitive and based on academic scores as it still is today. I never met a student whose last name was that of a building on campus. Nerd power was respected. For my class, when we had our 50th reunion in 2007, President Susan Hockfield wrote, MIT's physical campus may have changed, but its core mission has not. Our commitment to excellence is as strong as ever. I fully agree with that, and I think you do too. The feel and look of MIT, however, was being modernized in the 50s. The graceful curves of Baker House contrasted with East Campus. Hayden Library was a visual delight. Its map room and music library were there for diversion. The famous architect, Eero Saarinen, changed MIT's face with his designs of Baker, Kresge, and the chapel. The path for an undergraduate to achieve professional standing in science, architecture, or engineering was going to be arduous and long. In those days, before Europe, the chances to get involved with research or to get to know our professors out of class were minimal. But with time, many of us did get involved with research and even teaching. Paul Grabe was my TA in Signals and Systems. A few of us never left MIT. The class of 1957 contributed four full professors to the Institute, Ed Roberts, Al Drake, Al Artumre, and myself, plus one notable building, thanks to Ray Stata. After a year abroad, I returned to MIT and entered Doc Draper's instrumentation doctoral program, the same program followed by Sheila's husband, Bill. In the meantime, our world of aerospace had changed beginning on October 4th, 1957, with the launch of Sputnik and the dawn of the space age, many of us became space cadets. 
Doc Draper directed both Core 16 and the Instrumentation Lab, where missile guidance systems were designed and the exploration of Mars was envisioned. President Jim Killian was the science advisor to President Eisenhower. And we later learned he and Edward Land developed the plans to build the U-2, a spy plane to monitor the missile buildup of the Soviet Union. In 1961, Jerry Wiesner became President Kennedy's science advisor and ardently opposed spaceflight. The Aero Department was filled with heavy hitters such as Ray Bisplinkoff, Bob Siemens, and Guy Stever, who regularly moved from Cambridge to Washington and back. They advised the government and the National Academies. Long before Sheila became Secretary of the Air Force, we had departmental faculty serving at the Pentagon as chief scientist of the Air Force. Others were called to NASA. Jack Karabrock, Jimmy Barr, Wynn Markey, and Gene Covert, and Dan Hastings all brought some of MIT to DC. Wes Harris, Dave Miller, and David Newman continued the important technical exchange with NASA. Outstanding professors like Holt Ashley and Eric Molo Christensen taught fluid mechanics, and wind tunnels were in use for teaching and research. Wally Vandervelde would start on the upper left-hand corner of the blackboard and finishes electron control theory at the lower right-hand corner, just as the bell rang. Dick Batten would go on to design the Apollo guidance and navigation system, taught orbital mechanics. Incidentally, Sheila succeeded Batten in teaching his orbital mechanics course. Jack Karabrat led an advanced propulsion dream team, including Jim McCune and Gordon Oates. Our omnipotent technical instructors, John Barlow and Al Shaw, helped the clumsiest of us to, break, to build things that actually worked. My mentor, Y.T. Lee, carried on Draper's broad approach to teaching, although he declined to use the arcane, self-defining Draperian notation. Leon Trilling and Harold Walkman were known for their deep concern over the well-being of each student. On the other hand, we did have one professor who shall remain nameless, who was sometimes referred to as the shadow. Like the radio character, he possessed the power to cloud men's minds. We knew we were good and would be in high demand after graduation. We benefited from the nationwide growth in technology and the rising status of engineers and engineering. Atomic power was then expected to answer the world's growing thirst for clean, cheap energy. Radar was largely developed in Building 20. Jets made their way from the military to the commercial transport. The Boeing 707 introduced jet set into the social lexicon. The sound barrier was broken and the F-86 outflew the Big 15. Computers were beginning to make their mark on everything from air traffic control to giving stock market advice. For my master's thesis in 1958, I used overnight batch processing with punch cards. McCarthyism and the Red Scare made us cautious about speaking out or attending demonstrations, at least until the 60s. Drugs were not yet in general use, although alcohol was commonly abused. A steak dinner at the Newbury Steakhouse on Mass Avenue cost 99 cents, since any meal over a dollar incurred a sales tax. Many of us lived on Back, on back Bay and walked briskly across the Harvard Bridge each morning, counting our progress in smoots. For folk music, we listened to Joan Baez at Club 47. Well, with luck, we might catch Tom Lehrer at Harvard as he lampooned Verna Von Braun as well as Havoc, or late night jazz at Storyville. When Life Magazine did a story on our class, I was told they asked for our class song and a riff on the Mickey Mouse song they sang M-I-T, P-H-D, M-O-N-E-Y. When Sheila and I were students, engineering science meant going to basic principles rather than looking up a solution. The MIT first year requirements were rigid and tough. All freshmen took full year courses in chemistry, physics, calculus, and Western civilization. Only two majors, aero and naval architecture, also required drafting. There was no biology requirement back then. Since MIT is a land-grant college, we were supposed to be in ROTC and take military science, at least for the first two years. We all had Saturday classes, and that left the rest of Saturday to play and drink. Every living group, it seemed, maintained an archive of 
Bibles, the solutions to home problems and quizzes from previous years. For many, the humanities subjects were taken less seriously. Even though we had world-class instructors, we re relied upon our ward copies of Burrington's for tables of integrals. A leather slide rule case held our slipstick. Calculators were not yet in our toolbox. The student innovators of digital systems gathered in the Model Railroad Club and relied on relays as logic elements. On spring and fall afternoons, I would often sail a tech dinghy between MIT and the Boston shore. I would race one afternoon a week, but never won. Bill Widnall, a couple of years behind me, was already one of the top skippers. In the winter, my relief was the Alpine ski team. Only two of us were not Norwegian. As to social life, MIT in the 50s looked like an all-men's school. According to my classmate, Professor Ed Roberts, my class started with about 900 freshmen, of whom only 20 were women. McCormick Hall was not yet built, so women known as co-eds were not housed on campus. Many lived at home and commuted or were residents of the women's dorm on Bay State Road. Few undergraduates were people of color. Foreign students were limited by quota to 5% of the class. About 10% of the class were commuters. Social life and dating opportunities, as described in the tech, were misogynistic to say the least. Voodoo Magazine was a college-level playboy without the centerfold. On campus, the prevailing attitude toward the toot was mixed. We respected MIT and were proud to be there. We even loved it in a certain sense, but it was tough love, which probably accounts for its success. I'm proud to be part of it today. I'm delighted to join friends and colleagues in congratulating my friend Sheila on her extraordinary contributions to this extraordinary institution. Hello, Sheila. Back in the fall of 1998, I had just joined the faculty in our department. And my first teaching assignment was a grad level subject in fluid mechanics called Introduction to Fluid Mechanics. And it was co-taught with you. Little would I know that many years later, I'd be here trying to describe all of your contributions to fluid dynamics. Of course, a full description would mean I'd talk about helicopter and aircraft noise, unsteady aerodynamics, turbulent flow, other things. I'm going to focus on your seminal work on vortex stability, and in particular, the Widnall instability. This is an image of the trailing vortex system set up behind an aircraft. The swirling velocity of a vortex has a tight region known as the core, which then transitions to an outer flow where the velocity dies back off as one over the distance from that core. The maximum swirl velocity can be shown to scale with the weight of the aircraft and scale inversely with the span squared of the aircraft. In the early 70s, there were some large aircraft that were about to come online, in particular the Boeing 747 and the DC-10. And the concern was with the large airplanes was that this would cause an increase in the maximum velocity in these vortex cores and be a safety issue. So here's a little bit of a, a chart that shows some of that. You can look at W over B squared compared to say the DC-9 on this chart. And these are all aircraft that were around around 1970. And you can see that the Boeing 747, for example, is 20, 30% greater than any other aircraft of the time. So that was the concern. And this led to significant investment in the understanding of the physics of vortical flows, trailing vortex systems in particular, and how long does it take to dissipate a vortex? And just as a little sense of that, if the only thing acting on the vortex to dissipate it was viscosity, um, it would take a long time. So as a sense of that, days, several days to say reduce the velocity down to 10% of the uh, initial velocity in the vortex core. So fortunately, there is more than viscosity at work. When you look up in the sky, you'll often see a picture like this of the wing vortex wake system. The oscillation is known as the crow instability. This oscillation occurs over a length, has a wavelength of about eight times the span of the aircraft. And it was first described in a paper that was published in 1970 by Stephen Crow. This is one of the key mechanisms that causes the vortex 
uh, system to dissipate faster than just by viscosity. By bringing the vortex cores closer together, they interact strongly and the opposite swirls uh, will tend to dissipate each other more rapidly than if they were left alone. Now, if you look a little more carefully, you'll see there's a smaller oscillation occurring on the vortex core. And here's an experiment that you can see that more clearly in. In this experiment, you see that small wavelength instability, and that instability is known as the Widnall instability. It has a wavelength which is about the length of the core of the vortex. Subsequent studies by others have shown that the combination of the Crow and Widnall instability accelerates the dissipation of a vortex faster than just the Crow instability alone. And while this is an already important achievement, at the same time that Sheila was working on this, she also showed that the same mechanism exists and is present in another common fluid dynamics phenomenon. I thought a live demo might be useful here. That's right, Widnall instabilities occur on vortex rings. Here's a picture from a study in 1973 by Sheila and her graduate student, doctoral student, John Sullivan. Um, this shows a seven period instability on the vortex ring. Now, vortex rings have a wide range of applications. Uh, they're observed in fundamentals of transition and turbulence, atmospheric phenomena, ocean phenomena, combustion, supernova, plasma dynamics, blood flow, it, you name it, and any type of fluid mechanics, fluid dynamics situation, um, ring vortices occur, and this Widnall instability is quite common. Through the rest of the 70s and into the 80s, Sheila and her students produced a seminal series of papers on vortex stability. Here's a sample of some of those. Now, I want to return to the end of the video for a second, uh, and, and let's watch what happens next. <laughs> Gandalf, my old friend, this will be a night to remember. A metaphor I can't help but think of is that after you taught the world something about vortices, Sheila, you then set sail on new courses, which showed us how to be better as an institute and also as engineers. So Sheila, uh, here's wishing you a celebration to remember, fitting of your career to remember. Thank you very much. My title is aligned with some of the flavor of aerodynamics in today's celebration of Sheila's contributions and impact, but it has a broader reference to leadership, to literally creating the wake and being someone we strive to keep up with. To make this more tangible, let me use an analogy from biking, something in which both Sheila and Bill have been very involved. For example, they did the 460 mile ride across Iowa, RAGBRAI is the acronym, when Sheila was Secretary of the Air Force. So the image is thus not only about who makes the wake, but about the benefit for us, the benefit of being in the wake. That's the main point. The focus will be on Sheila's internal contributions. Many of these are connected with students and to which she has put a great deal of energy and thought. And these have meant a great deal to our department and more broadly to the Institute. There are four attributes you'll see. Problem solving, getting to the heart of the matter and creating solutions, achieving awards and recognition for colleagues and students, standard setting, showing how to do the right thing, and leading by example. Let me start with lessons learned from co-teaching and working with Sheila over the past several decades, in which the same observation occurs over and over again. That's of seeing her just happen to be in the right place at the right time with the right solution to a problem. An example is that Sheila and I co-taught our experimental project subject in which teams of two students carry out a year-long project. One year a student dropped out midway through the process, leaving his teammate with an overwhelming amount of work. 
Sheila just happened to have a first year student advisee who just happened to be interested in the project and could help. This was a wonderful solution that was simple in retrospect, but that required identification of the issue, constructing the opportunity to solve the problem, in other words, bringing the pieces together, putting the ideas into action. Simple, one might say. Lucky that Sheila was there, one might say. A small problem, one might say. However, when you see a very long string indeed of such situations, you marvel at the way Sheila is able to resolve so many things that could turn into problems for students, but simply don't because of her intervention. This can also be seen outside our department in the MIT committees that Sheila has chaired, which you'll hear about from the provost. One of these committees, in response to the abrupt disbanding of the Department of Applied Biological Sciences in 1988, outlined a formal process for openness and fairness in reorganizing or dissolving departments. Whenever such a change occurs now, there's in-depth review and report to MIT senior leadership by what is referred to as a Widnall Committee. This is now part of the way that MIT does things. And I must apologize for venting at this point, but when I chaired one of these committees, and this was 30 years after Sheila's chairmanship, it was still referred to in absolutely definitive terms as being a Widnall Committee. The term Greitzer Committee was not much in evidence. Another topic starts with Sheila getting to MIT early in the morning. She may be the first to arrive in our department, and when I get calls at 7 a.m., and there are usually messages already left, there's no need to look at the caller ID. These early morning calls often come because Sheila has solved a difficult problem we were both interested in, usually in a way I would never have thought of because it is a carom off something to ricochet off something else to drop neatly into the pocket. Sometimes she uses the opportunity to tell me that I am the one who should do the caroming. If so, there's not typically nothing to say except, oh yes, I should, that's the right thing to do. A different aspect is Sheila's work in helping faculty colleagues gain recognition for their accomplishments. A former department head, Ian Waits, asked Sheila and me to help make this process more integrated in, into our culture. And she has been enthusiastic and effective in identifying candidates for awards and marshalling support for nominations. She developed a long-term campaign to help colleagues move up the AIAA ladder the AIAA is our professional society. And this has meant focus on junior faculty, interactions with their mentors to obtain nominations and outreach to identify supporters. In this, there's further evidence of a talent or capability you may note in other talks today, namely that it seems impossible to withstand a request from Sheila. So she has ratcheted up the process and engaged and empowered other faculty to amplify our efforts and our successes. Now, doing the right thing often means creating higher value solutions to questions. Here's another Widnall example. In the selection for an MIT award, two of the candidates truly shone. I was part of the decision making, and as I often do, I called Sheila to ask for advice about which one to choose. She listened, thought about it, and stated in no uncertain terms push back and recommend giving the award to both. A terrific result. I'm sure you've taken the point, which is that I asked Sheila how to do something right and she answered me in terms of doing the right thing. There's a difference between the two. I want to show now two photos that capture another interaction concerning the undergraduate project subject I mentioned. Sheila supervised the two student team on a wind turbine project. So the first picture has Sheila, the student team, and me. And there seems to be some disagreement, some issue. Emily looks worried, Jeff seems unsure, and Sheila is pensive. The next picture shows the resolution. My comments have been dealt with. I've been literally removed from the picture. The team and their advisor are all smiles and an A-level project resulted. In our department, Sheila is a major part of our conscience. She holds us to high standards. She recognizes and she steps up to, without being asked, 
to teach a graduate subject in astrodynamics, to attend and give advice in student presentations, to give wise counsel in our end of term grading meetings, and a host of other things that support our department and simply make things better. Faculty meetings often evolve in an unmeasurably small time from discussions of principle to battles between fiefdoms. Over and over, Sheila is the one that pulls us back to think about the issues on a department, school, or institute appropriate level. An article about Sheila in Technology Review mentioned that when she arrived at MIT in 1956, there were 23 women in her class. It also said that as she progressed from undergraduate to graduate student to professor, the proportion of women kept shrinking. And the quote is that in the department faculty photograph from 1967, she was the only one without a tie. Sheila has stated that increasing the percentage of women undergraduates was one of her big things. And an issue connected with this was our own MIT admissions process. In the late 1980s, she worked with Art Smith, who became Dean for Undergraduate Education, to address this. Art shared with Sheila the data from his study of the connection between student SAT math scores and the actual performance at MIT, plus his conclusion that the test was a bad predictor of success for women. At her urging, he rethought MIT's use of the test. And from 1989 to 1990, the proportion of women in the first year class went from 26 to 38 percent. A quote from Sheila sums up the, the situation. I said, look, the women we want are the women that are applying. We should just admit more of them. End of story. Finally, a consistent pattern in Sheila's approach to major issues from her description of the reasons for the narrowing of the pipeline for women in engineering several decades ago, to the recent National Academy's re report about sexual harassment that she co-chaired, has been, and this is part of the standard she sets, specific recommendations about practices, so that not only can we aspire to make ourselves better, we can measure ourselves in a data-driven manner. Well, I've covered several dimensions of Widnall impact, but the approach and especially the results have been the same. Those in the wake of Sheila Widnall are better for it. It's been a privilege on many levels to have been her colleague. Dear Sheila, dear colleagues, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be speaking to you today at Sheila's retirement party. My name is Olivia Devec, and I'm a professor of aeronautics and astronautics and engineering systems here at MIT. I've had the pleasure and the honor to be Sheila's faculty colleague for the last 20 years. And when I think about Sheila, there are three things that come to my mind. Steadfastness, integrity, and supportiveness. And I'd like to share an example for each of these three with you. My very first week on the faculty was September of 2001. The morning of September 11th, I got a call from my wife, Lynn, who called me and said, something terrible has happened. You have to turn on the television. My first impulse was to walk across the hall into Sheila's office, and she did have a television and it was already turned on. Together we watched in horror as two airplanes crashed into the World Trade Center and the third airplane into the Pentagon. It wasn't clear what was happening, but it was clear that it was a major event and that it wasn't natural. It, that it was a terrorist attack was pretty obvious to us. What I noticed immediately was how calm Sheila was, both at the same time realizing the seriousness of the situation but also being very calm. This calm and confidence really came through when she pointed out where her office was in the Pentagon. And I think we've all benefited from this steadfastness over the years. The second thing I think of when I think of Sheila is integrity. I'd like to point out as an example of that, the work she did on the Columbia Accident Investigation Board. She spent well over a year of her life 
together with the commission, analyzing the causes, the root causes of the Columbia accident where the shuttle orbiter entered the atmosphere with major damage on its wing, which led to its disintegration in the atmosphere and the loss of crew. Both the technical expertise, but also the organizational understanding that Sheila has displayed was absolutely exemplary. And I think it's probably one of the very, very best accident reports ever written in the history of mankind and in the history of technology. The NASA Standard 7009 for models and simulations is one of the very important outcomes of that accident investigation that we still benefit from today. And the third thing I would say is Sheila as a friend, as a colleague, and as a mentor. Over the last 20 years, I've always been able to just walk across the hall and sit down with Sheila, her always being available, even early in the morning, and just sitting down and talking things through, career choices, uh, big events happening at MIT. And after leaving Sheila office, I always felt that I had another perspective a useful way or a different way to think about the problem. And I will deeply miss the opportunity to talk to Sheila on a daily basis. That being said, Sheila deserves her retirement. We're very proud of her and we wish her all the best. Sheila, thanks for everything you've done for me, for MIT and for the nation.
What a pleasure it is to join the celebration of Dr. Sheila Widnall's extraordinary career. With her seminal work in fluid dynamics, especially aircraft turbulence, Dr. Widnall is not only one of the longest serving secretaries ever, but also among the most technologically credentialed. Her wide-ranging experience served Dr. Widnall well. She streamlined acquisitions processes. She explored privatization alternatives for virtually every Air Force function, from computers to base services to depot maintenance. As Secretary of the Air Force, Dr. Widnall successfully launched the legendary workhorse, the C-17 Globemaster. During her leadership, the F-22 Raptor also took flight, combining stealth, agility, and situational awareness to redefine air power. Dr. Winnall understood that airmen are the heart of the Air Force. She focused on their resiliency during a turbulent period that saw force reductions, new missions, and high operations tempo. Just as she did in academia, she inspired all 815,000 total force airmen to go beyond their notions of what was possible. Her foresight and out-of-the-box thinking prepared the Air Force to defend freedom and international norms during Operations Southern Watch and Northern Watch in Iraq and deliberate force in Bosnia. As co-chair of the Defense Department's Task Force on Discrimination and Sexual Harassment, Dr. Widnall removed artificial barriers to advancement across the military. Dr. Widnall epitomized the Air Force core values of integrity first service before self, and excellence in all we do. And for the first time, she codified the core values so generations of airmen would have a North Star to guide them. Sheila, you set a high bar. More importantly, your service lighted the path for others. Thank you for your leadership, congratulations on your success, and best wishes on your retirement. Hi, Sheila. I wish we could all be together in person today, but alas, given the circumstances, Zoom and video and virtual will simply have to suffice. Ladies and gentlemen, Sheila Widnall has led a truly distinguished career and life. And very important for me, she has been a trailblazer and a first in many ways for women in America. Born in Tacoma, Washington, Sheila started her MI career in the year 1956 when she came to MIT as a freshman undergraduate degree candidate. And eight years later, she had not only earned that undergraduate degree, but she also earned a master's and a PhD in astronautics and aeronautics. Now, let me tell you, there weren't very many students at MIT that looked anything like Sheila in those days. In fact, there were only 23 women out of that class of 936, and there were even fewer women who were pursuing the course of study that Sheila pursued. And by the way, in case you're wondering about the number of female faculty members in those days, the answer is there were exactly zero in those days, zero. Well, Sheila looked around, assessed the situation, and decided things needed to change in pretty short order. So after graduation, not that long afterwards, she went on to become the first woman appointed to the MIT faculty for the School of Engineering. And a little bit after that, she was appointed the first woman to serve as the chair of faculty at MIT. But of course, most important to me is that Sheila eventually went on to become the first woman to ever lead the branch uh, within the US military because you see, she served as the 18th Secretary of the United States Air Force. She served the Air Force during the administration of President Bill Clinton from 1993 to 1997. And in those days, she had a junior colleague named Deborah Lee, who was the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs. Now, spoiler alert, that was me in those days. And that was really the time that I got to see Sheila Widnall in action. And if you believe as I do in what goes around comes around, and if you believe as I do in karma, the lessons that I learned from Sheila Widnall from the 1990s served me extremely well later in life, precisely 20 years later in my life, 
when I became the second woman to ever lead a branch of the U.S. military. Because you see, I was the 23rd Secretary of the United States Air Force from 2013 to 2017. Now, the first lesson I learned from Sheila was the importance of people. Her people-first attitude came to work with her every single day. She made it a point to travel extensively. She spent time with her airmen. She enjoyed those famous bike rides. And most importantly, she listened to her people. And when I say people, I mean all people, all different ranks and all different types of people. Sheila Widnall was an advocate for diversity and inclusion before it was cool to be an advocate for diversity and inclusion. And she was also a staunch defender of the Air Force's core values of integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. Finally, Sheila Widnall worked very, very hard to improve the quality of life programs for our Air Force family. Because you see, she saw her role in a broad sense, not just for the personnel who are serving in uniform, but also for those who serve those who are in uniform. The second lesson I learned from Sheila was the importance of modernizing our Air Force and investing in new technology for the organization, even during times of tight budgets. Sheila had a hand in many of the programs of those days, but the two that I remember most importantly are the C-17 and the F-22, which believe me, continue to be workhorses within the force to this very day. The third lesson that I learned from Sheila was all about leadership and about grit. Washington, you see, is a very, very difficult, divisive, partisan environment. And there are many, many pressures that are brought to bear upon the Secretary of the Air Force. But ultimately, the person in the seat at the time has to be able to make the tough calls and live with the key decisions. And of course, that was Sheila Widnall during those years. She had to defend and explain those decisions, sometimes to a not very uh, welcoming Congress. And I always observed that Sheila, despite the pressures, was able to remain calm. She always meticulously gathered the facts. She weighed a variety of concerns and listened to all of the stakeholders who had an interest. But then she made those tough calls and she always fell back on what she thought the right thing to do was. And that to me is what real leadership and real grit is all about. Sheila, there's no question, the Air Force is a better institution because you spent the time at the helm that you did. And MIT is a stronger institution as well, thanks to your advocacy, thanks to your leadership, thanks to your scholarship. And I know that your husband, Bill, and your children, Anne-Marie and William, are richer human beings for the fact that they have had you in their lives for so many years. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being the giant that you have been and for having those broad shoulders that so many of the rest of us were able to learn from and stand upon. Uh, best wishes to you in your retirement, and I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you. Sheila, I just wanted to send my congratulations on your retirement. I remember when you were named as Secretary of the Air Force and I was so proud that my service was the first one to have a woman as Secretary of the Air Force. And I never dreamed at that time that I would be one of your successors. But every time I walked down the hall at the Pentagon and I saw your portrait there in that flight suit, it always made me smile. You open doors for the rest of us. And I don't just mean those of us who became your successors as secretaries of the Air Force. I mean women around the country who needed to know that anything was possible. Here at the University of Texas at El Paso, we have a saying that you can't be what you can't see. For so many young women, for the next generation, you were the woman that they could see. Thank you for everything, and God bless you. Good afternoon. 
Uh, I am General Lester Lyles, a retired Air Force a four-star general. It's an honor to participate in this retirement ceremony in tribute to Dr. Sheila Widnall. Now, I have the honor of representing all of the senior officers and general officers who had the opportunity to serve under Dr. Widnall during her tenure as the Secretary of the Air Force from 6 August 1993 to 31 October 1997 becoming the first woman secretary of one of our nation's military services. Now, Dr. Widnall was the first woman, but she certainly was not the last. Uh, I'm proud to say that the Air Force has had literally in the last three secretaries, three women, the Honorable Deborah James, the Honorable Heather Wilson, and currently uh, current secretary, the Honorable Barbara Barrett. You know, you can talk about first associated with anything involving Sheila Widnall. I could go on and on and on and mention lots of firsts. But she was also the first secretary of the Air Force to have had four chiefs of staffs as her wingman. General Merle McPeak until October 94 from the time she came on board initially in 93. General Ron Fogelman from October 94 until August of 97. Uh, and after General Fogelman retired, acting general, General Ed Eberhardt, from August 97 until October 97. And then finally, General Mike Ryan from October 97 until Dr. Whitnall left as the secretary at the end of, of October 97. Now, Dr. Whitnall, I did not get a chance to talk to all four of your chiefs, but I specifically want to pass on comments from Juan, Ron Fogelman and Miss Jane. I think you know Miss Jane is recovering from a major stroke that she uh, suffered earlier this summer. Nevertheless, she specifically wanted me to send her best wishes and blessings to you and to your bill. Ron, who was your wingman the longest, told me that they particularly remember how much you and Bill love coming to the Air House, the Chiefs of Staff's official residence on Fort Myer, uh, for any sort of major social event. Though Ron quickly pointed out that uh, that may have been primarily because the Fogelmans had two cats, and you and Bill evidently love cats. Miss Jane also told me that she proudly remembers how Bill fit in as a member of the Air Force Spouses Club. Uh, he dug in, became a contributor, and he was just like all the others in that particular event. She was very proud of that. And Rod also noted that you and Bill always seemed to leave Air House, whatever functions there may have been, before they got to that fighter pilot tradition at the end of the night of drinking Jeremiah whiskey and sucking eggs. Now, frankly, I don't blame you for that. Ron Fogelman and Mike, Fog uh, Mike Ryan both mentioned your push to include women in the top leadership of the Air Force. That included Libby Kiefer as the Assistant Secretary for International Affairs and Sheila Cheston as the General Counsel of the Air Force. And finally, Ron Fogelman told me about how proud you were the day you came into the Pentagon and he came into the Pentagon uh, from one of your many trips that you had taken where you announced that you had finally achieved the first ever unmanned flight. You made a flight where you were the pilot, you had a female instructor pilot and a female crew chief. So I guess from that standpoint, it definitely was unmanned. Another tribute to you that I heard was from Natalie Crawford of RAND. Natalie was a co-chair of the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board when you came on as the secretary, and she was so proud that you pushed the SAB to expand its membership to include commercial technology experts. That led to them inviting people like Alan Mulally, then with Boeing, and soon to be the CEO of the Ford Company, to become an SAB member where he served so very, very well and has set another tradition of bringing on civilian experts to our Air Force Scientific Advisory Board. Finally, uh, I've obviously talked about your achievements in the past, Dr. Whitnall, but one of your many lasting contributions, and there are many of them, to our Air Force are our core values. Those three values, integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do, were established over 25 years ago, it's hard to believe, under your steady watch, and they are enduring. They've guided the Air Force in everything we've done in the past, everything we're doing today, and certainly everything that we will do in the future. So Dr. Whitnall, I know I speak for all of the officers and airmen who have had the honor of serving under your leadership. It has been a distinct honor. 
I wish you and Bill uh, all of God's many blessings and great health and happiness, and I proudly salute you. As you have already heard, Secretary Widnall is a woman of many firsts. She was described by a former president as a woman of high achievement, a respected scientist, a skilled administrator, and a dedicated citizen. She achieved all of this while also being a daughter, a wife, and a mom. But she is much, much more than that. She is the 12th woman to have been elected into the National Academy of Engineering in 1985. And her citation reads, for fundamental contributions to the fluid mechanics of rotary and fixed wing aircraft and for outstanding service to engineering education and to the profession of engineering. She has participated on more than two dozen committees, task forces and studies as an NAE member, in addition to being the vice president of the NAE from 1998 until 2005. She also served on the Columbia Accident Investigation Board in 2003. She was recognized for her service to the NAE in 1993 when she received the Distinguished Service Award. In 2009, she received the Arthur M. Bika Award in recognition of her remarkable academic career in fluid dynamics, the highest levels of public service, enhancing the relationship between government and academia, and for championing the role of women in engineering. In addition to being an expert in fluid dynamics and advancing the field of vertical short takeoffs and landings, Secretary Wignall did something else that was extraordinary. Throughout her career, she worked hard to ensure that other women and underrepresented minorities would have the opportunity to pursue an engineering career. She conducted research on the changing attitudes and trends in education for prospective engineers and scientists. In particular, in seeing more women and minorities become scientists and engineers. In 2018, she served as co-chair of the NAS, NAE, NIM report on sexual harassment of women in science and technology. I mentioned she was a woman of many firsts. She was a first for me personally. As a member of the Aerospace Board of Trustees, from 1986 to 1992, she was one of the first female role models in a senior leadership position across the entire aerospace industry. Every time she walked into a room, it made me smile and it gave me courage, as I'm sure it did the same for every other woman in the field. Secretary Widnall, Thank you for your inspiring leadership for all women, for all engineers and scientists, and for our nation. Congratulations on your retirement. Hello, I'm Ed Birchinger, a professor of physics at MIT, and it's my great honor to interview Sheila Widnall about her contributions to mentoring, especially of people from underrepresented groups in engineering. Her impact has been large, not only at MIT, but across the country. I had direct experience of her care for students during many meetings when I served as MIT's inaugural Institute Community and Equity Officer. Today, we recognize her career-long contributions to the development of talent that has helped to make Course 16, MIT at large, and the engineering profession an exciting place for young people of every background. 
As other speakers have noted, Professor Widnall has served in many roles where her commitment to equity, inclusion, and mentorship were at the forefront. I remember well her leadership as president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And I read with great interest her 1988 presidential address, Voices from the Pipeline. I had recently joined MIT as an assistant professor of physics and was excited to see the leadership of women from this fine institution. Professor Widnall, thank you so much for joining me for this interview. I wanna follow up on your experience as president of the AAAS in the 1980s, noting that you regularly highlighted the need to improve the recruitment and retention of women and underrepresented minorities in science and engineering. Since that time, the numbers have grown substantially at MIT and elsewhere. What do you think are the main factors responsible for this success? MIT studied the underlying reasons for the low admissions rate for women students. And we concluded that the math SAT was not an accurate prediction of the capability of women students as measured by their senior grade point average and their ultimate success. We changed our evaluation methodology to evaluate the math SAT scores on a different basis. And in the first year, the percentage of women admitted, moved from 26 to 38%. And it has continued to rise and the data prediction has been validated. Currently, about 48% of MIT undergraduates are women and they are widely scattered across schools and departments. I've seen that remarkable change in the student body during my shorter career at MIT. And I've often wondered, how did it come about? Was it just the admissions office? but evidently your service on the Committee on Undergraduate Admissions in Financial Aid and those of others had, had a big, big impact. Uh, can you say a little bit more about the uh, study that you did and how it was that you convinced your colleagues and the MIT Admissions Office to uh, change the use of the math SAT? Well, the original study was done by Professor Art Smith, who was the head of the Electrical Engineering Graduate Program. And he and I were actually carpoolers together. And we rode into MIT every day. And he had two daughters who ultimately went to MIT. So I, maybe he had a special interest in this. But he did a study, a very simple data study, plotting on a graph the math SAT as a function of grade point average. And he got two clouds, one cloud for men, one cloud for women. And it what it said was we should add 40 points to the math SAT score for women. And the admissions office, there was no pushback on this. Everybody said, yeah, let's do this. This is data driven. Let's, let's do this and see how it turns out. And it was extremely successful. During the last 20 years, uh, Professor Widnall, you've advised many undergraduate Aero Astro majors at MIT. During the last decade, 40% of your advisees have been women. What impact do you think uh, your mentorship has had on these students, especially the women? I've had an incredible number of excellent students. And my role is to understand them deeply, to give advice when requested, to provide suggestions of directions to take and problems to resolve. I assume that seeing a woman as a faculty member as their advisor gives them some confidence in MIT's commitment to the education and advancement of women. How often would you meet with your advisees and does it vary depending on their career stage, whether they're beginning students or more experienced students at MIT? Well, clearly we start out at the beginning of the semester uh, with our advisees, but we make it clear that the office is always open. Um, I was not doing a lot of traveling as an advisor, so I was really available and so they could pop by any time. I also had Many of my advisees were also taking the courses that I was participating in. So there was opportunities to interact with them. Last year, the National Academies published a consensus study report called The Science of Effective Mentorship in STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Math, and Medicine. And in that report, they highlighted several functions of mentorship, providing psychological and emotional support, role modeling, career guidance, skill development, and sponsorship, that is, opening doors for the mentees. Which of these resonate most with the way that you approach mentoring? Well, as an advisor, I interact with students depending on the situation. 
If they are having academic or personal problems, we talk, examine solutions. If they're seeking career advice or potential summer jobs or internships, we deal with that. I've helped them deal with family problems. Graduate students are my research partners. They grow into the role, they give seminars, they publish papers, they become faculty at other universities or take exciting jobs in industry or government, as well as advancement in the military. Have you involved any of your graduate students in the mentorship activities? Do you, for example, utilize uh, what some people call ladder mentoring, where senior graduate students may mentor junior graduate students, mentor your op students, and so on? I would say a little bit. We had in our department a experimental project lab that had two undergraduates working on a project. And I often involved a graduate student in that. Those were laboratory projects, wind tunnel tests. So there were some opportunities to really get graduate students involved with undergraduates. Could you share a couple of examples of the ways that you've helped your mentees in their careers beyond MIT? Well, some of the things that I've been doing is providing linkages for summer jobs, internships, co-authoring papers for journals, interacting on family problems. And I've been issued two or three patents that have been co-authored with students. And many of my advisees have been Air Force ROTC students. Many have gone on to fighter pilot training and they keep in touch. And I have written several letters of recommendation for them. Recently, I received an email from a former advisee. It was incredibly meaningful. And he said, thank you for having been a constant force of positivity, passion, and support while demonstrating unparalleled humanity. Looking back over the years at MIT, asking you to take me on as an undergraduate advisee was the best decision I made at MIT. Another email from former ROTC students. Hello, Professor Widnall, how are you? I hope all is going well. John and I had dinner yesterday and we were reminiscing on the days at MIT. We wanted to reach out to you and let you know how everyone is doing. Nico is about two weeks from graduating pilot training in Wichita Falls, and he just got assigned the F-22. Martin finished the F-35 basic qualification course and is enjoying survival school in Spokane. John is midway through the F-16 basic qualification course in San Antonio. Alex is on another deployment to the Middle East in the C-17 and is living in Seattle. He is hoping for an assignment to Hawaii. James is working as a satellite engineer in Albuquerque. Victoria is on another deployment in the Pacific in the EA-18 and is living in Iwakiun. I am one simulator away from finishing the Introduction to Fighter Fundamental course in San Antonio, and I will be moving to North Carolina for the F-18 basic qualification course. I finished my Aero Engineering Master's from Purdue about two months ago. And thank you again for your recommendation. That's truly wonderful. When you started as a faculty member, did you anticipate or expect so much satisfaction from mentoring? The impact that you're having on these many people's lives is truly wonderful. Well, it, it's really wonderful to be involved with these young people and their passion for aerospace, the passion for fighter pilot training, their passion for everything they're doing. It's just, it's just incredible to be a part of that. Let me ask you about a, a related topic. Like many science and engineering fields, Aero Astro has growing numbers of women, but still relatively few Black, Hispanic, or Latinx, or Indigenous students. What should we be doing differently to improve the recruitment and retention of these students? Well, I've certainly been aware of these students, and I've, and I've interacted strongly with them, and, and some of them have been incredibly good. I mean, they've been the best student in the class. So I think the important thing is to give them self-confidence that they can do this, to show that you have confidence in them and that they can do this, and, and that will put them on a platform for success. I know that the research on uh, students of color in STEM shows the importance of establishing a sense of belonging and professional identity with the discipline. And your mentoring style seems to 
really support that in the students. Why should younger faculty strive to excel as mentors? What's in it for them? Well, it's part of the community. I mean, they, they are going to be mentored by senior faculty and they should turn around and interact with younger students to help them along. And it's, it's a learning experience. It works both ways. So they should think of it as a laboratory experiment. Uh, how can I make my career better? How can I make the career of my students better? How can MIT help make effective mentorship a stronger part of our academic culture? Well, our students are very excited about AeroAstro. Many of the, our students built model airplanes, drones, launched rockets in grade school and high school. And so when they come to MIT, they've had a lot of hands-on experience with aerospace engineering. And so we build on that and we amplify it through your ops, laboratory work, and our curriculum. We all share a special interest in aerospace activities and their potentials. I think that MIT is an incredible platform for the education of our students. We have the capability to treat them as individuals, to respond to their needs, to encourage them to pursue their dreams, and to deal with challenging problems. So it is an excellent place for a student to take that next step in their life experience. Thank you so very much, Professor Widnall, for sharing this time with us on your mentorship, career, and impact at MIT. Thank you. Great to spend time with you. MIT has been my home since I arrived in 1956, one of 20 women in a class of 1,100. I was born under the final approach to McCord Air Force Base in Tacoma, Washington. My mother was a juvenile probation officer. My father rode bulls in the rodeo. One important theme in my remarks is the incredible support and mentorship that I received during my career, and I hope I have given it back. In my case, I was very fortunate. When I won the high school science fair in Tacoma, Washington, I was approached by the owner of a local specialty construction firm who had a PhD in civil engineering from MIT. He said, you should go to MIT. And I said, okay, where's that? He and his fellow Seattle alums made it all possible through their scholarship support. At MIT, my strongest mentor was Professor Holt Ashley, a colleague of many of you. When I was a sophomore, he said to me, you should go to graduate school. And I said, okay. He made that all possible for me. Only now do I realize what that takes. I was the second woman appointed to the MIT faculty and the first woman appointed to the faculty of the School of Engineering. I was the first woman to serve as faculty chair and I also served as chairman on the admissions committee and served two terms as the chairman of the discipline committee. I served as chairman of several important faculty committees, each often referred to as the Widnall Committees, which were tasked to develop institute policies for important issues. Like many MIT professors, I was involved in many outside professional activities. My first involvement with the government in DC was as director of university research for the Department of Transportation. This occurred because Bob Cannon came up to me on the podium after I had won the Outstanding Young Man of the Year Award from the AIAA. He said, I'd like you to come to Washington and be the first director of the Office of University Research at DOT. And I said, okay. Then there was the call from Bill Carey, the executive officer of AAAS. He said, are you a member of AAAS? And I said, no. He said, would you be willing to join? And I said, well, why would I do that? He said, we'd like you to run for the board. And I said, okay. Following my service on the board, I became president of AAAS. Through the AAAS connection, I met David Hamburg, the former president of the Institute of Medicine, who was also president of AAAS. At that time, David was president of the Carnegie Corporation of New York. He asked me to serve as a trustee. And I said, okay. Dave had an incredible public policy agenda. One of his strong areas of focus was the role of the scientific and engineering community 
in providing advice to the government on important scientific, technical, and public policy issues. To that end, the Carnegie Corporation established the Carnegie Commission on Science and Technology. Members of this commission included Norm Augustine, Bill Perry, and Guy Stever. I felt privileged to serve. I served as the vice chair of the board of trustees of the Carnegie Corporation. Warren Christopher was chair. Fast forward to fall and the election of 1992. With the election of Bill Clinton, Warren Christopher was asked to help identify cabinet members and other senior officials for the new administration. Carnegie lost four board members, Bob Rubin to Treasury, Donna Shalala to HEW, Warren Christopher as Secretary of State, and me to the Air Force. The Carnegie Commission on Science, Technology, and Government contributed Bill Perry to Defense, and Jack Gibbons was tapped as Presidential Science Advisor. In December 1992, David Hamburg called me and said, Sheila, I've got a great idea, and I've talked it over with Sam Nunn and Les Aspen, who had been tapped to be Defense Secretary, and they think it's a great idea. And I said, David, what is that? He said, we think you should be Secretary of the Air Force. And I said, David, that's a great idea. When the offer began to gel, I was windsurfing in Aruba. I went to the board shop and made two phone calls to ask my mentors for advice, Chuck Vest and Bob Siemens. I was the first woman to serve as Secretary of the Air Force. It was an incredible experience. My principal contribution was to elevate and establish the Air Force core values across the entire Air Force, integrity, service before self, and excellence in all we do. I also started the EELV launch vehicle program, which developed the Atlas V and the Delta IV launch vehicles. These vehicles still provide the entire launch capability for national security launches. There has never been a launch failure. I have also actively encouraged young women to pursue careers in science and engineering. In my AAAS presidential lecture, Voices from the Pipeline, I described the environment facing women who want to enter science and engineering and identified the aspects of that environment that makes them feel less than welcome. At MIT, we made an important discovery that the math SAT underpredicts the performance of women. Being data-driven, we applied this knowledge, and in one year, the number of women admitted rose from 26% to 38%. Their performance validated our expectations based on the data. And by the way, the percentage has continued to climb. Women now comprise 48% of MIT undergraduates and are a majority of the undergraduate students in half of our engineering departments. As a faculty member, I have had intense interaction with students both undergraduate students and graduate students. I have supervised theses, co-authored papers, counseled on various academic issues and challenges. My students have gone on to successful careers, and I have a special relationship with the Air Force ROTC students, many of whom have gone off to become fighter pilots. My research is focused on fluid dynamics with special attention to flow instability. Of particular interest was our study of the instabilities of vortex rings, often referred to as the Widnall instability. I had to explain to my Air Force aide that referring to the Widnall instability was a compliment, not a criticism. I have served as president of AAA, vice president of NAE, and a board member of both the Carnegie Corporation and the Sloan Foundation. MIT has been a welcoming and effective environment for me as I have moved to accomplish my principal goals and I am debted to my MIT colleagues who made it all possible. Engineering faculty are an important part of the structure of the aerospace industry. They are the glue that holds it together. They educate students, solve important engineering problems, consult with industry, found companies, serve in government, and they are the backbone of the system of professional societies. They serve as officers and play important roles in AIAA, IEEE, NAE, and AAAS, among others. They serve as journal editors, publication reviewers, technical committee chairs, and members. They evaluate members for their membership advancement and technical awards, and I am proud to be a member of this community. So I thank MIT and my colleagues for supporting me in what turned out to be an incredible experience. Thank you all.
It is my honor to close this event for Professor Sheila Widnall. We've heard many words to describe all she has done and who she is. These words include first, trailblazer, problem solver, standard setter, role model, advocate for diversity and inclusion, cares about people, steadfast, outstanding mentor and others. These are wonderful words to say about a person and speak volumes to her values and character. It's clear from all these laudatory words about her that she's had a major impact. Impact is something that MIT cares about. She's impacted the field of fluid dynamics. She has impacted the Air Force, the National Academy of Engineering, MIT, and the Aero Astro Department. She's impacted the lives of students which she has mentored. It is telling that her former students write to her and say how fortunate they were to have her as a mentor. She's been a source of wise advice to individuals and to the institution that is MIT. We are better off as a result of her wise advice. Her influence lives on through the impact of the many Widnall committees. Former Secretary of the Air Force and current President of the University of Texas at El Paso said, you cannot be what you cannot see. As a result of, quote, seeing her, Many have been inspired. I have been inspired personally by her example. Sheila, congratulations on a stellar career at MIT and in the nation. Congratulations on your retirement. You've been a pathbreaker and paved the way for many to follow. We are proud that you've been part of the MIT Aero Astro Department. Thank you for all that you have brought to us.